uh, now I think it's time that we move on to um, a deeper, a slightly deeper uh, understanding of uh, what Lacan describes in all of these three stages. And this, in, this entails discussing a discussion of the psyche, the psyche, which is, you know, a work expanding on uh, Freud, Freud's work. But um, Lacan was the man who uh, took this and um, added the element of language and linguistics. According to Lacan, there are three major structures that control life and desire and need and everything. There are three major structures. These correlate to the three main moments in the development of the child. And when we say child, we mean from zero to four years, five years, and so forth, a child. After five years, then the, 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 the person then ceases to be a child, and they then begun, be, they embark on their journey throughout their you know, adolescence and uh, maturity and everything. Stage one is the real. Stage one is the real. Yeah, uh, it is what um, Lacan uh, signifies as a very material existence, a material existence. Stage two is the imaginary. Now, what is the imaginary? The imaginary is, you know, it's basically uh, what it says. If we take the word literally, imaginary, it's the image. It's the image where there's an image of self. There's an image of self. And stage three is the symbolic. And what is a symbolic? Well, you know, it's a complex system of signification. It's a complex system of social signification where the individual somehow um, continuously places itself, places itself in an order of social things. That is the basic beginning of the Lacanian psyche. Uh, it builds on Freud, and we will see how in a second. Okay, so let us first discuss the real. What is the real? The real signifies the nature from which we sever when we employ language. Before we get language, before we embark on our lifelong um, affiliation with language, according to Lacan, uh, there is the real, which is our connection to the material world. And it's interesting how he calls this the real, and of course there's a, there, there, he has reasoning for calling this the real, but he calls this the real where he calls our non-material existence reality. So if we go back to Peirce, we see that, you know, the ways in which we define things, and if we remember our discussion of the John Cusack movie, 1308, 1308, we know that nothing is real unless it's emotional. Okay, so this is the neonatal child, the neonatal child, the child which is just born. It just comes out of the, its mom and, you know, it, the first thing it does within 10 minutes or 20 minutes or an hour is latch onto the breast and starts to feed, and that's what it does. It needs to do nothing else but eat and, of course, sleep and excrete. Otherwise, there's nothing else it needs to do. If it doesn't get its food or sleep, it cries. It cries. That's its form of communication. And that's it. Okay. And the child quickly realizes that by crying, it gets attention, it gets food, it gets to be picked up and hugged and kissed and cleaned and everything. And, you know, it quickly realizes that crying becomes a, a semiotic. A semiotic. So, in its neonatal stage, there's no separation with the other. The child is everything, everything else. There's no separation, no separation. There's a completeness which is lost in entering language. When the child, when this neonatal child begins to enter language, begins to hear and use language, its first words and everything, it loses this completeness, this completeness. Okay. For the child, the real is impossible. It's impossible. It's unexpressible in language as entering language marks, remember, it marks an irrevocable separation from the real. Entering language marks an irrevocable separation from the real. Once it enters language, it cannot be connected to the real anymore. It cannot connect itself to the real. 
Connecting to the real is an impossibility vis-a-vis -vis reality. What is reality? Well, we're going to speak about reality. And remember, reality is our reality of things, reality. Not the real, but reality. There's a difference, um, a stark difference, a real difference between real and reality. Okay. The real erupts. There's an eruption of the real when it comes back. It traumatizes us. Because once we leave the real, once we um, experience that irrevocable, irrevocable uh, separation from the real, then when we see the real again, it becomes very traumatic. It becomes traumatic as it threatens our reality. The real erupts when we acknowledge materiality, the materiality of our existence. Okay, there's an eruption. Because when we see the real again, it awakens us, well, awakens us to the fact that the real has been ignored. And this is you know, Lacan's basic idea of the, the development of the child and how it ignores the real and then becomes once again uh, introduced to it. And then there's, it's traumatic, it's traumatic. The real, according to Lacan, is also intrinsically elusive. It's elusive. That's what it's meant to be. We cannot obtain the real, the material. We cannot obtain the real. It resists capture in comprehensibly meaningful formulations of concatenations of imaginary symbolic signs. Lacan tells us that the real is intrinsically elusive. It cannot be reached. It's like an asymptote, where we can get increasingly close but we can never get there. Resisting capture, resisting capture in comprehensibly meaningful formulations of concatenations of imaginary symbolic signs. So as we um, deploy our imaginary symbolic signs, we find that we, um, and formulations of these uh, concatenations of imaginary formulaic symbolic signs, then we cannot ever achieve the real. It becomes elusive and very asymptotic. Let us have a look at our diagram now. And this is the, you know, the signification that we get uh, in the neonatal stage. Uh, there's the um, signifier of things. It's an initial, simple, basic, fundamental signification. And the signification is really uh, the needed material uh, which is highly linear, you know, the mother's breast, and that's about it. Okay, possibly a toy, uh, a red ball or something, and that's about it. The next stage of Lacan's work, the stage which is um, connected to the mirror stage, is the imaginary. Now, the imaginary is where it begins to get quite complex, and uh, we, we began to discuss a little while ago the imaginary and what it is, and it's really the image of the child, the image that the child perceives about itself. It looks into a mirror, it literally looks into a mirror one day and sees itself and says, wow, that's hot. Why? Because it sees something coherent. It sees something. It suddenly opened its eyes to something coherent in general. The imaginary realm exerts influence throughout life. It keeps going throughout life. It's not just, you know, then. Of course, it keeps going, but it subsides, it, it recedes, and submits to other things. But it's there, you know, there are always times when we think, wow, I'm really cool, and look at this new leather jacket. I look great. But it's at its most intense when it's novel, of course. You know, novelty is very intense. It's the most intense thing, novelty. That's what life is, novelty and intensity. And then it recedes and submits to other forces. The imaginary and the later symbolic, which we will discuss, are inextricably intertwined and in tension with the real, which was the neonatal phase. And remember, there's always a tension, always a tension throughout life. It never stops, but you know, there are peaks and troughs and we are now speaking about the imaginary peak in the second stage, the mirror stage. And the uh, imaginary, of course, is very central to Lacan's account and accounts of ego formation. 
the development of the imaginary or the imaginary stage marks the movement of the subject from a primal need of you know, very, very material things, you know, the food and sleep, and that's about it, and to be cleaned when his diaper is all dirty and soiled, to what Lacan terms the demand. demand. So now we are at the stage of demand. So the baby begins to demand. Demand. What? Mm. Demand things. And things of an imaginary nature. Lacan tells us that in the imaginary phase, in this second phase, the mirror stage, there are restricted fears of consciousness and self-awareness. Okay, consciousness and self-awareness begin to emerge, but they're quite restricted. They're not, they're definitely not complete in any way, of course not. They're definitely not developed, but it's a start. The baby has embarked on consciousness and self-awareness. It becomes aware of that. There is some sort of separation that can later be placed into a symbolic, social order of things. Here, the real is mistaken as symbolic and, mis and the symbolic is mistaken as real. So, you know, there's a lot of confusion still. The baby has still not worked anything out, really, but it's begun to work things out, you know, begun to get things. Okay, so demand and desire. Um, these are two words that uh, Lacan really uh, appreciated the use of and he really went to town in using these words, demand and desire. And the, he spoke about that uh, needs can be fulfilled. You know, and this was a central part of his argument, of course. Needs, the need, material needs can be fulfilled. Demands and desires are unsatisfiable. They're asymptotic. They get to, um, they get to close to being um, satisfied, but they can never be satisfied. Demands and desires can never be satisfied in uh, a process of uh, metonymy. We are going to speak about metonymy in a little. Um, autonomy is really basically um, the inability to ever reach a certain target, autonomy. All right, but that's later on, and all these things are later on and everything, you know. And it also, it's also beneficial for me because I don't have to fit a million things into one sentence or one paragraph. I can, you know, gradually one thing at a time, and, you know. Yeah. All right, a DJ can never play um, more than... Um, two songs at once, or everything gets really messy. You, know, you have to play one or two songs at once, mix them together, and then go on in the syntagmatic structure of a DJ set. All right, we continue. Okay, the difference between demand and desire. What is the difference between demand and desire? Well, um, desire, we acknowledge language, a law and community. You know, in desire, we acknowledge that there is some sort of symbolic practice called language um, and also society through which we frame language and language becomes a, a framing element, a mechanism. During the mirror stage we see that there is demand. Lacan tells us that during the mirror stage there is demand by the child. As the child misrecognizes, misrecognizes, you know, there's the imaginary uh, perception of its stable, coherent, whole self. It sees itself and he thinks, mm, I'm stable, I'm coherent, I'm whole, I'm whole. And this does not correspond to the real child. Now, the real child is actually a very temperamental, still always crying, you know, wanting toys and um, pounding its feet and hands on the ground if it doesn't get to go see its cousin or something. You know, there's, so there's no coherence still. There's no order. There's, there's a great disorder and a lot of chaos. So at that point, the child imagines that it's um, orderly and whole and cohesive, coherent. But in fact, there is very little coherence. The idea is that the child sees the imaginary aspect of itself and it hopes that it's uh, co coherent and everything, but then it realizes it's not. And there's a, a, the beginning of the pro very long, lifelong process of um, um, desire for improvement. Within a, this discourse of desire, uh, says Lacan, this discourse of desire, which predominates later on, it's the third stage, not now, but now we're speaking more about demand, but within the discourse of desire for Lacan emerges the perpetual deferral, the perpetual deferral of bringing into consciousness. Now this is, this is Lacan's main argument in this work. It emerges the perpetual deferral, the perpetual deferral of bringing into consciousness into presence, into being, the object of 
desire. Desire becomes a definite reality, a definite thing to include in all of life's actions. Within the discourse of desire, says Lacan, emerges the perpetual, the perpetual deferral of bringing into consciousness, into presence, into being the object of desire. We may get close sometimes, and in fact, we are told by Jakobsen that, uh, and Lacan that it, it, we get close through metaphor, metaphor. We get close, but we never ever actually achieve this. And we'll speak about Jakobsen, of course, later on. Jakobsen is very central to our work in linguistic anthropology. We will speak about Jakobsen extensively later on. Jakobsen is, you know, um, also someone that we have a, a lot of respect for. Jakobsen's work is um, central and very significant, and um, he uh, he remains as um, a, a rock in the river. You know, his work and the person, the academic. That Jakobsen was, Jakobsen of course is gone now, um, the person who Jakobsen was um, has remained um, you know, very steady, very steady and very solid in the uh, anthropological, linguistic anthropological um, mindset of um, academia. Okay, so uh, this deferral is quite important, especially later on in desire. Desire, what is desire? Desire, uh, Lacan tells us, is that which cannot be signified. It cannot be signified in the endless metonymic, there's that word metonymy, in the endless metonymic, unachievable movement of discourse and in the way in which the unconscious functions. Desire is that which cannot be signified in the endless metonymic movement of discourse and in the way in which the unconscious functions. So uh, Lacan tells us that we can never ever achieve desire. It's always there, and once we achieve it, it kind of disappears because um, it's not needed anymore, you know. And this is, I guess, what Lacan is telling us, that desire is there, um, but it's evasive. And we walk towards it, we try and get it, and as soon as we get to it, it disappears. Lacan tells us about separation. He tells us that as a child begins to separate itself from the other, it begins feeling a sort of anxiety caused by something lost. When it separates itself from the mother's breast, there's an anxiety caused by something lost, the sense of something lost. It loses this food source or this comfort zone of the mother. The demand of the child is to integrate with the other, becomes to integrate with the other, as it seems to be in the child's lost state of nature to integrate. Lost in its, you know, it was there in its neonatal stage and then it disappears and, okay. The child's demand is impossible to realize, yeah, and functions as a reminder of loss and lack. This child's demand is impossible to realize according to Lacan. Okay, but this um, impossibility in realizing the, uh, the uh, demand brings, or awakens in the child some sort of desire, desire to re-achieve that, that, um, uh, that connection, that integration. So the child, to compensate, what does the child do? According to Lacan, the child creates an, uh, images of itself in the mirror stage of a perfect self to compensate for its loss. The separation, says Lacan, the separation occurs with imaginations of self and other. So, you know, the, the child begins to imagine itself and uh, imagine other and ideal versions of self and other. Um, and the separation occurs with these, you know, placing the, itself in, in um, in society or you know, in its own conception and perfecting itself and perfecting the order of society and everything doesn't, you know, it does help but it does not satisfy this, uh, this uh, lack, this void, this void that the child is experiencing. The image of the child is a fantasy that the child creates. It's an image, it's imaginary, yeah? it's not real. But then again, which signified is real? Okay, but the image is 
um, something quite distorted to what the child is. It's a fantasy that the child creates to compensate for a sense of lack or loss. An ideal I or ideal ego is what it creates. An ideal I or ideal ego is imaginary. The fantasy image of the child of self is also filled by the others that the child emulates. So the child also tries to emulate, you know, projects itself onto others or projects others onto itself role models, superheroes, and so forth. And this becomes a narcissistic relationship. As the connection to the mirror stage suggests, the imaginary is primarily narcissistic. Okay, it's narcissism, it's narcissism. It's seeing yourself as better than what you are, narcissism. If you recall your Greek mythology, of narcissism and everything, and you know, Oedipus, which we will discuss in a little, Despite the grounding fantasies of desire, it's a narcissistic process. And the compensatory device, which we're discussing now, is moving into the lack that for Lacan defines a human subject. Okay? That is a compensatory device. It's moving into the lack that defines the human subject by imagination, imagination according to Lacan. So in this, in this stage then, the imaginary stage, we have our uh, the self, image of self, signification process. It's a complex progressive signification. There's an idealization of self. There's signification and hence awareness of the whole and individualized self. And the signified is um, an image of self, which is the self now, but an improved version of self, as opposed to the material in the infancy stage, which was really all the baby saw, a very, very simple signification. If we have a look at the next diagram, we see what goes on in this process. So the conceived self begins as the um, initial signifier, SR0, and there's some sort of projection through a dialogic negotiation, and this becomes the first signified. And the baby uh, or the infant perceives itself as ideal. It's a perceived, perfected self. This then becomes a signifier again, and the baby reconceives itself and measures itself and says, well, you know, this is who I was, this is who I am, how am I? And then it reprojects itself and develops a new idealized I, a new perceived, perfected self. And the signification process just continues in the series of perpetual infinite semioses. And in this way, the child increasingly integrates itself into the personal symbolic order. We're going to speak about gazing um, just a little. And, you know, the idea of gazing, according to Lacan, is very important because, you know, you're gazing um, at things. You're gazing at your mother. You're gazing at yourself. You're gazing at society and the separation of society and everything. So gazing is quite important to Lacan. Uh, Gazing, said Lacan, is very significant to the mirror stage. He tells us that, look, you know, it's central to the mirror stage, this gazing. The subject in the mirror stage, the subject apparently achieves mastery. Mastery of, you know, of what? Of self, of, you know, um, um, conceiving and perceiving and conceiving self by viewing self as an ideal ego, the ideal I, says Lacan. And this becomes... You know, if we take a Vygotskyan perspective, or if we look at the work done by the great Vygotsky, this becomes a dialogue with self. And it becomes a scaffolding process, as we saw in the diagram just before. And in the words of an old friend of mine, um, I recall years and years and years ago, like maybe 20 years ago or more, 25 years ago, when I was, um, um, I think I was in high school and I was introduced to Vygotsky. Uh, I said to my friend, oh, Vygotsky, wow, his work is great. Um, uh, my, my friend's comments were, uh, who was actually uh, I think, uh, doing his postgrad in university or something, said, uh, Michael, in the shadow of the great Vygotsky, we are all small people. So, you know, you know uh, very true words, and the great Vygotsky is definitely the great Vygotsky. Very unfortunate that his life was ended so young, uh, and we will discuss Vygotsky later on. Okay, so this is a scaffolding process. The subject enters... Uh, a culture and language, 
the subject enters the culture and language by establishing its subjectivity, its own subjectivity, through a reflected fantasy image. Okay, so it enters its own subjectivity by looking at itself and seeing itself and saying, hmm, hmm. So that becomes a subjectivity. And it becomes a partner with whom to practice um, some sort of dialogic activity. To practice, um, you know, it's a start. It's not really um, enough by anyone's standards, but it's a start. To practice a dialogic activity, a social dialogic activity. You know, you're better than me, I'm better than you, I can be better than you, let's see how I can be better than you. Let's see how you can be better than me. Let's see how we can make some improvements, you know, and fit into society. So, what happens? The subject then aspires, aspires towards the ideal version of the image it creates throughout life. Not just today, not just tomorrow, but throughout life. Sometimes stable and free of its material drives and constraints. Following this then, Lacan tells us, is as the subject enters a symbolic order, which is the next phase, these narcissistic yet ideal images of itself um, are maintained in the imaginary order. We still you know, maintain these, not like we, we rid ourselves of these, uh, they're maintained. Um, but other things come in and, you know. So the fantasy image, says Lacan, the fantasy image of the self is substitutable with others with whom desire um, becomes an emulated process. We emulate others, right? So the self ceases to be uh, a handsome version of me as the baby and it starts to become, you know, Jessica Alba or, or um, uh, uh, Shibata Jun, who is a Japanese pop singer who is great, who I really like, um, or, you know, John Coltrane, the sax player, or somebody, you know. So let's now look at a um, a graphical representation of this once again, which is pretty much the thing we saw before. It is uh, the conceived self um, scaffolding with itself and becoming the ideal I, then reassessing, recalibrating itself to become a new conceived self and then projecting to become an ideal I and so forth. So let us describe this quickly. So what happens in this diagram? The subject initially projects or signifies what seems to be the optimum self. Uh, the subject then attempts to, to interact with the image. There's a, some sort of interactive dialogic process and attempts to accept the signification from the projected self. So then the subject measures, it measures, it calibrates the image with its own requirements or the requirements for daily life by attempting to appropriate signification. It then recalibrates the image for a new projection and hence either develops a new signifier or a new signified. This signification must align with that appropriate for social interaction, otherwise it will recalibrate or it says, well, I've got to recalibrate or something. And a Vygotskian type of scaffolding occurs and this includes um, an idealized version of itself or idols or, um, you know, these handsome people uh, in the movies that it sees, or superheroes and so forth. 